All right, in this video, we're gonna briefly explore a little into the basic neural architecture for perception. So we're gonna get into the brain stuff for perception. To start off, we know that all of our senses first go to a primary receiving area in the brain. Like your eyes send their signal to the very back of the occipital lobe at the back of the brain. The initial stop there is called the, the primary visual cortex in red here, or V1, V for primary, one for, or <laughs> one for primary, V for visual. Uh, neural signals, if they come from your ears though, they first go to the primary auditory cortex in green here. It's kind of at the top of our temporal lobes. Signals for touch and other bodily senses, somato, it means body, so bodily senses, go to the blue area, the primary somatosensory cortex. And this is just a little strip at the front of the parietal lobe there. From there, each of our senses has some secondary processing areas nearby. So like in this next picture, the, the darker region of color, that's what we just saw, the primary area for each sense. And the lighter color around it, that is areas still dedicated to making sense of that input before sending it on to other parts of the brain. It's just sort of like a secondary area for that sense. Now, the question that we'll be talking about in this video is, where does the info go once it moves out of these primary and secondary areas? Like, once something visual is initially processed in those early areas, it needs to be shared with the rest of the brain, integrated with what we're hearing and feeling and letting us recognize and label and think about what we're seeing. So this video is all about the pathways or, or the streams of information going out from a primary sensory area. Now, just a reminder, we know that the parietal lobe up top on our brain, it's specialized for processing spatial information, in addition to having that strip at the front that receives body senses like touch. So we know this is a brain area for helping us interpret things three-dimensionally, making sense of what's in front of what, what, what's close to us or far away, or what's to the left or the right, that sort of thing. And to do that, it's gonna have to eventually get information from our senses, like sight and sound, right? In order for us to understand that our visual input is showing one object behind another or on top of another, or to realize that we're hearing something from above or to the left, which means even though sight and sound initially go to some other brain area in the occipital or the temporal lobes for their first stop, they will eventually be sending that information to the parietal lobe to make sense of it spatially. Then you may remember what we know about the temporal lobe. So in addition to being the first stop for audition, for our sense of sound or hearing, and helping us make sense of language, the temporal lobe is also essential for recognizing and categorizing things. That doesn't just mean recognizing things from our sense of hearing, like recognizing your mom's voice or recognizing a wolf's howl. It also means distinguishing a cat from a dog by how it looks, having concepts that tell you a dog looks different from a wolf, but more similar to that wolf than to a whale, uh, that a basketball has a round shape, or that a face has a mouth below, a nose below, two eyes, that cars have a general visual form, and so on. So once again, even though the temporal lobe is our first stop for the sense of sound, it has to at some point get input from our other senses. It has to get some axons coming in from the occipital lobe in order for us to recognize and categorize the things that our visual cortex started the processing on. Which brings us to what cognitive neuroscientists call the dual stream model. So in the dual stream model, sensory information, it gets processed first in that primary and kind of the secondary nearby areas for that sense but then it's gonna get sent in two distinct pathways of neural connections, two distinct uh, streams of information, one going up toward the parietal lobe and the other going down into the temporal lobe. That means for vision, for example, the sense we've been concentrating on, visual information starts in the occipital lobe, but then projects outward following the two paths we see here. Now, the name for these two pathways uses anatomical terminology, just to get used to this. So you've probably heard of like a dorsal fin on a dolphin or a shark, right? The dorsal fin is on their back, not their belly, right? In anatomical terms, you can think of dorsal as the back of the body or the top of the body, and ventral is the belly or the underside of the body. So if we're looking at this dog, the dorsal part of his brain would be along the top and back of his head. And the ventral part of his brain would be along the bottom of his brain, right? Kind of like where his belly is. Us humans though, we're a little weird because we're bipeds, we stand on our feet. so. Our dorsal, what we call dorsal, it goes along our back, and then when it gets to our head, it just kind of wraps up along the top, the back and top of our head, 
Meanwhile, ventral means our belly side, right? But then when we get up to the brain, that kind of wraps along kind of under our chin or whatever to the underside of the brain is ventral. So when looking at neuroanatomy stuff, we, we use those labels like this, like this green arrow here. Dorsal means kind of the top and back of the brain. Ventral means like the bottom and more to the front of the brain, okay? So the just kind of looking at the green line here, those will be the terms that we'll use for these two streams of processing of visual information. Some of the visual info, when it comes from our occipital lobe back here, some will go up in what we'll call a dorsal stream, and some will go down and forward in what we'll call a ventral stream. And that's all we're talking about here is those two directions. So let's start first with the dorsal stream, where information from our primary visual areas, it's gonna go up toward and eventually into the parietal lobes, okay? And there it's gonna integrate with like spatial information, with bodily information, with our other senses, especially for our ability to act within space. So the dorsal stream is often referred to as the where pathway because it helps us process where things are in space, like making spatial sense of what we're seeing. But later researchers actually amended that to think of it as a where slash how pathway because it's also where we use visual information to do things, like to act within space. When you reach out and turn a doorknob and you're using vision to guide your hand to turn that doorknob, to reach that doorknob, that is a dorsal stream kind of task. Like, think about this kid reaching out to grab a toy or anytime you reach out to grab a water bottle or to pick an apple off of a tree, right? Your brain is sending out motor signals to control your muscles. But in order to send your arm in the right direction and to know when to clamp down your fingers, you need to process what you're seeing visually, like how close your hand is getting to the object, whether you need to make corrections because the object's a little off to your left, or because it's a huge apple, so you need to open your hand a bit wider, or whatever. We use visual information to guide our actions around our body, right? That's what we mean when we say the dorsal stream is a where and how pathway. It's all about using that sensory information to take action within space, especially within the space around us. So this is one of those areas, by the way, where cognitive psychologists overlap a lot with developmental psychologists. Like developmental psychologists have studied the development of the dorsal stream, the the vision for action stream in little kids to see how the system changes in the first couple of years of life. So like this study here, they showed 18 month, uh, 18 month olds, so one and a half year olds, they really suck, totally suck at using vision to pre-orient a shape before they try to slide it into an opening. But 24 month olds, so at two years old, kids do this just fine. So this basic task, by the way, it's called a posting task because it's similar to posting a letter, meaning putting a letter in a mailbox for the postal worker to pick up. Uh, I actually published an article on this topic a while back where my colleagues and I, we tested kids at two, three, and four years of age in a, basically a more complicated extension of the posting task where we had them, they had to rotate or flip objects of, of even more dimensions to manage more spatial relations at one time in order to align the object into a groove that matched to kind of insert it in there. And we actually found that in this more complicated version, only three and four year olds ever held the object above the groove and, and like visually guided it before making contact with the surface. Whereas younger kids needed more the haptic feedback from pushing it against the groove to can rotate and flip it then while they're feeling it with their hands. And we also, by the way, studied monkeys and chimpanzees doing this task to understand like the dorsal streams vision for action system from a more evolutionary perspective as well. Uh, and neuropsychologists have studied this stuff, like with patient DF, uh, who could align a card to go through a rotated slot when actually inserting it. So her dorsal stream or vision for action system was functioning just fine. If she was actually reaching out and putting the card through the slot, worked just fine. But she couldn't match the orientation when just looking at it. In other words, when doing a sort of static orientation matching to just recognize angles without actually posting the, the card, without doing the action of putting the card through the slot, she couldn't do it. She was horrible. Meanwhile, there's actually a double dissociation here because we find other neuropsychology patients, people with damage lower in the brain, in that more ventral zone, that can recognize an angle in the static and moving task. They can do that just fine. But when they're using vision for action, when they're reaching out, when they're using the where how system, they can't orient a card to put it through a slot. They can't use vision to direct how to angle that card as they're trying to actually put their hand to put it through a slot. Likewise, Back in the 80s, researchers found this same double dissociation of the, the two visual streams in monkeys. So using an animal model, they found this in monkey brains. This one's kind of sad because it's invasive animal research, but 
they trained monkeys in two simple tasks. So all the monkeys learn these two simple tasks. They're really easy for a monkey. They learn that the food is always in a hole under the triangle. So if you lift this up, there's a little hole there where some food can be put in. There's no food under the rectangle. There is food under the triangle. Even if we swap sides, it's always gonna be under the triangle. They can learn that. It's really easy. It's an object discrimination task where they just have to visually recognize what an object is. But the monkeys also learned a landmark discrimination task, a more spatial task, where the food was always under the red lid that was closest to the cylinder, the landmark, right? So it's a spatial aware kind of task. So we could mix things up. We could put the triangle on the right side or the left, and they know to always look under the triangle, put the cylinder either close to one side or close to the other. They'll always grab the and flip up the one that's closest to the cylinder because that's where the food is. Then the real experiment started. So that was the training. Then they took all these monkeys in the experiment. And for half of them, they did a little brain surgery. They actually damaged the monkey's brains. They created a lesion in part of the pathway going up to the parietal lobe. In other words, in half the monkeys, they damaged part of the dorsal stream, the warehouse stream. And in the other half of the monkeys, the other group, they damaged the pathway going down toward the temporal lobe instead. So in the monkeys who had their dorsal stream damaged, they could no longer do the bottom task. They couldn't do the landmark discrimination task, though they still did fine at the top task, the recognition one. And in the monkeys with the bottom pathway damaged, the more ventral pathway going in the temporal lobe, they could no longer do the top task. They couldn't recognize one object from another, but they could still do the spatial task just fine. Landmark discrimination, no problem. So in both neuropsychology with human patients and in animal models, we have a clear double dissociation of these two pathways having two different functions in terms of how they use visual information. And that brings us to the other pathway. So we talked about the dorsal pathway. The lower pathway we'll call the ventral stream. Because remember, ventral is the anatomical term for like the underside, the, the opposite of dorsal. And the ventral stream takes information from where it's initially processed at the very back of the occipital lobe, and it's gonna send it down and forward toward and, and eventually into the temporal lobe to be recognized and categorized. So we can think and talk about and categorize what came into our visual field. Thus, you'll often hear this part referred to as the what pathway, because it allows us to, to know what we're seeing with vision, okay? In fact, if we look at parts of the occipital lobe, we're just looking at different parts of the occipital lobe that are going down and forward towards the temporal lobe. In some areas of the temporal lobe nearby and, and in that the uh, occipital areas approaching the temporal lobe, uh, we find a number of brain areas that seem to be specialized for visually recognizing a particular kind of thing. Like in the LO, the lateral occipital complex, we've got a brain area that's specialized for recognizing familiar objects. Like when you sit with someone in a brain scanner and you show them pictures of objects, this area activates a lot. If it's a type of object you've seen before, this area lights up, it has extra activity beyond baseline. But if you show them a face or a place, this area doesn't activate very much, nor does it activate much when you take a familiar object picture and you scramble the picture up as a control condition, doesn't work. But then elsewhere, the underside of the, the like temporal lobe in the fusiform gyrus, so this is looking at the brain from underneath the brain, underneath the lobes, but at the, at the lower layer of the uh, temporal lobe, or sorry, I guess it'd be around here is the fusiform gyrus. Um, at, at the lower part of the, the temporal lobe, there's an area called um, the fusiform face area or fusiform gyrus. It's, it's selective to recognizing faces visually. So it only goes off when you show a picture of a face, but not to other pictures like places or objects or cars or whatever. There's also an area called the parahippocampal place area or PPA that seems to be uh, selective to, to recognizing places. So it's this area inside the temporal lobe, kind of on the inner temporal lobe close to the hippocampus. So that's why it's called parahippocampal place area. And it goes off specifically when we see places. Other areas, by the way, are selective to recognizing, categorizing body parts specifically. So we have one called the extra striate body area. Or there's areas selective to firing for tools versus other things. So in this ventral stream, this lower stream where visual information is sent down and forward into the temporal lobe, we get the brain not using the visual info to guide our movement through space, but just to recognize from visual stuff, to recognize visual form and shape and color and use that to identify what something is, to activate our conceptual representation of it, the associations we have, maybe to remember the word for it and things like that. Okay, but now that we've seen these two streams, the dorsal where-how stream and the ventral what stream, 
Let's see what happens when parts of these brain pathways get damaged, say by a stroke or a tumor or a traumatic brain injury, because that'll tell us what those areas are normally doing in a healthy brain. So first off, because of what we know about the dorsal stream's function, it shouldn't surprise you that if some part of the dorsal stream gets damaged, we often see effects where it impairs spatial abilities uh, or seeing movement or motion, right? Because that's seeing things visually from one part of space to another, uh, or things like visually guided grasping and reaching and things like that. So for example, if one part of the dorsal stream is damaged, we happen to get a condition called optic ataxia. Optic is just like, like seeing or sight, right? So optic ataxia, where the person can't use visual info to guide their arm and hand movements. They can't just reach out and grasp things in front of them using vision as feedback. But if they close their eyes, they can do things by touch just as well as you and I can, right? With their eyes closed, they're the same as us, but they can't use visual information to guide their reaching and grasping around them in space. Now, like if a neuropsychologist holds a pin in front of them like this and says, grab this, they'll usually miss despite looking at it. That's the idea. Okay, another condition we often see if a different part of the dorsal stream is damaged, it's called simultagnosia where you, you can't actually perceive multiple objects at the same time. Like you can't place an object within a spatial scene. You don't see the whole scene of a bunch of objects together uh, or objects will run together into a jumble or you can't tell that one object is behind or in front of another. That's simultagnosia. So like with this top drawing, the drawing at the top half of the screen here, they would be able to report an individual feature they're currently looking at, no problem, but they're not able to understand the contents of the whole scene. So they wouldn't recognize that the kid is about to fall or that the kitchen is flooding. Here, by the way, is an example of a patient with optic ataxia. Once you make some contact, you can use this touch sense, no problem. I want you to reach out and grab it from me. Good. So that's an example of optic ataxia, the first of the two conditions I mentioned. Again, usually happens after something like a stroke, some sort of or traumatic brain injury or something like that. Um, or I'll, I'll show you another example here in this video. There will be a patient with optic ataxia. But in this video, I want you to pay attention to a test that the guy does before testing for optic ataxia. So what he's testing for first is simultagnosia. What he's going to do after he kind of just pushes his hand in front of her face to see if she can notice close or far, he's going to test for simultagnosia by putting two objects together and seeing if she can tell apart which one is behind the other. So with a pin and a comb, he'll just see if she can tell. Uh, and since she does do that okay, he can rule out simultagnosia. And then he'll see that she has optic ataxia. By the way, just a warning, this guy has horrible bedside manner. So this is not normal and patients should be treated with way more humanity and respect when doing neuropsychological exams. Like at one point, this guy just grabs and moves the lady's arm without asking, without respecting her bodily autonomy. So don't act like this guy. Now, I'm going to have you tell me whether my hand moves toward you or away from you. Can you see it? Which way? Yeah. It's coming forward. Which way? This way. Look at the hand. Mm. Which way? It's going further now. Now it's coming closer. With no blink yeah. of threat. And I use her hand as a sti as the stimulus she does. Now, we're going to do the thing that gave you a little trouble earlier. We're going to have you reach and grab things from me, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, before I do that, there's one other thing I want to do. What do you see here? The comb. 
Okay. And what do you see here? The pen. And what do you see now? The comb and the pen, so there's no simultaneous agnosia. Now, which is closer to you, the pen or the comb? The pen. Are you having Okay. Which is closer to you, the pen or the comb? The comb. Okay. I'm going to mix them up and try it again. Which is closer to you, the pen or the comb? The comb. Okay. Which is closer to you, the pen or the comb? The pen. Very good. So that ruled out simultaneous. Now he's going to find out that she has optic ataxia. Now we're going to do some reaching. You weren't looking at it. Did you see it? Yeah. You just did it by... Okay. She did that by grab, feel. Okay, grab the hammer. So when she tries to use her vision, it's not Can working. you see it? Can you see it? No. Can you see it over here? She grabbed right past it. So that's optic apex. You tried that. All right. Another issue that can happen with dorsal stream damage, if the damage occurs in a, a slightly different area, so an area called V5 in this case, um, then the patient will become unable to perceive motion or movement. It's a condition called akinetopsia. So A for lack of, and then uh, note the root word there is kine, like kinetic energy or kinesiology is the study of movement, right? So the roots of the word literally mean lack of movement sight. So lack of movement sight, like they, they just can't see motion visually. Patients like this, they see everything as kind of just suddenly jumping around, almost as if real life has a really high latency in an online video game, rather than things moving smoothly from state to state. Like when you look at a flip book, right? Each page is a static image in a flip book, but our brain fuses it together. It constructs perceived motion out of that. Same thing with television and movies. It's just a series of static images presented in really quick succession. But part of our brain is dedicated to creating a perceived sense of motion out of that, so that's what we happen to experience. But someone with a kinetopsia doesn't have that function working. That brain area is damaged. So, for example, there's a patient named LM who had this. She described feeling really insecure at parties because people walking around a room would suddenly be here or be there, but not seen moving between the two places. Likewise, crossing the street was really dangerous because she couldn't perceive cars moving or judge their approach. And in fact, people with echinotopsia have a lot of trouble with basic activities of daily living. They need help. So LM said it was hard even to pour a drink like tea or coffee because she said, quote, the fluid appeared to be frozen like a glacier. And then suddenly it, had, it would have like poured out and it'd be everywhere on the table. And she's like, oh shit, I spilled it. So it's really hard to know what it's like to experience things that way. But here's just an attempt to kind of simulate echinotopsia. <clears throat> so this would be if you're watching cars with Light normal up. vision, Pace. you see them moving, you see motion. Mazda. This is what it might be like with a kinetopsia. Or they say pouring coffee here and you'll see it's not coffee, but you get the idea. So that's like a, a simulation made up just based on descriptions by patients like LM. Um, finally, there's another condition that can happen with the, the dorsal warehouse stream getting damaged. It's called spatial neglect. Sometimes you'll see this called unilateral neglect, meaning one-sided neglect, or you might see it called hemi-neglect, meaning half-neglect. But either way, in this condition, what's happening is the person becomes unaware of half of their visual field and anything in it. Like, they will only focus on one side of space and on one side of their body. Like, a guy looking in the mirror to shave in the morning will only shave half of his face, one side, not the other. And looking in the mirror, he'll be like, yep, I'm done, even though the other side of his face still has all the hair. Uh, and in a neuropsychological test, we might give them something like this, a, a piece of paper with X's and O's on it, and ask them to, to cross out all of the O's. Like, just put a line through every O. And what we get with a spatial neglect patient is this. They'll cross out all the O's on the right side, but maybe totally miss all the ones on the left without realizing it. They'll think they're done and hand the paper back without crossing out half of the O's or, you know, the ones on one side. Here's another task we might give someone with spatial neglect. We could ask them to draw a scene, either from scratch or from memory, you know, kind of thing, or to copy a drawing that we've shown them. 
And, and what will happen is they'll often only draw half of it. So depending on the, the subtype of spatial neglect that they have, they might only draw one half of the whole scene itself, or they might only draw one half of every object. Like here is a, a video example I'll show you. Uh, and again, apologies for silly background music. You get the idea. So their brain can't seem to pull their visual attention kind of to that side of space, having major issues with the wear pathway. This is a dorsal stream issue. And there are other conditions, by the way, but that's enough to give you an idea of it. Let's, let's move on to what can happen if areas along the ventral stream are damaged. So remember that the ventral stream is our what pathway for recognizing what we're looking at. So damage to the ventral stream impairs object recognition and it gives us problems seeing like form or shape or, or faces or putting names to things. These conditions are all gonna be called agnosias from the prefix a meaning lack of something and nosia means knowledge. So these are conditions, they're, they're all named as sort of a lack of knowledge about something, a lack of recognizing something. For example, in one part of the ventral stream, if this one area is damaged, we get something called form agnosia, where people can perceive parts or, or details of an object, but they can't actually integrate those parts together into a whole object. For example, if you give, if you give them the pictures on the left here and just ask them draw what they see, this is what someone with form agnosia might draw. They get some individual elements, but they can't see the whole object as a whole. Uh, interestingly, if you, if you ask them to draw from memory, like draw an apple or a book or a sailboat, they can draw from memory much better than, than copying one that they're looking at. So they understand what those objects look like. Their brain has a representation of what an apple looks like. What's damaged is the part of their brain that takes visual input to the eyes and organizes the patterns together into a whole. That's the idea with form agnosia. On the other hand, if different parts of the visual, visual stream go into the from the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe, if different parts of that get damaged, then we may see a different condition called associative agnosia. In this case, they can identify whole objects just fine, meaning they, they're actually seeing and, and sort of perceiving the object. However, they can't recognize it or, or put a word to it or activate other associations with it. So for example, a neuropsychologist might ask them to copy some drawings and they can copy the whole thing. They can tell it's a whole object. They're perceiving it at the, at the basic level of seeing the object. They do see it, but it doesn't click in the sense that it doesn't activate the conceptual associations in their temporal lobe, nor does it connect to like the auditory representation of that object and what it might sound like or the linguistic associations of what the word for it is. So at most they might kind of have a vague feel for the type of thing it is, but they can't quite get those associations to activate properly in this condition of associative agnosia. So the top example here, this would be what we see from a patient with form agnosia, that first type. If you ask them to copy what they see in the blue box, they can't. They can't see the whole object made out of those parts, even though if you look at their, their copy of like the number four down here, they did get the little horizontal bit. So they're, they're getting individual pieces and they can put a word to it. So that part of the system still works. Whereas in the bottom copy here, if some, that's someone with associative agnosia. So you might ask them to copy the stuff in the blue box, they will get it right. They're clearly seeing the complete object, but it isn't visually recognized. So they can't put a name to it or, or a concept to the object. Here's just a little more of the same data, by the way. On the left half here, the left half of the screen marked uh, panel A, we got them, um, someone with form agnosia copying like letters and shapes. On the right half is someone with associative agnosia, 
you can see a pretty clear difference in symptoms. Even though both of these, they're an agnosia for a very basic visual process, but form agnosia is more like, I can't recognize this as an object. Whereas associative agnosia is, agnosia is like, I'm seeing an object, I'm, I'm definitely seeing an object, I just, gosh, I can't quite put together what it is and what I'm supposed to know about it. Now there's other conditions, there's other agnosias if, if the ventral uh, area is damaged somewhere else. So there's also one called prosopagnosia. Sometimes it's called face agnosia, where someone can't visually recognize faces, even of their loved ones. Like they can't recognize their own kid's face or their own spouse's face or their own mom's face. Though if they hear the person's voice, they can recognize the person, no problem. It's just that the pathway from early visual centers back in the occipital lobe to the face processing area further in, you know, in the bottom of the temporal lobe, if that's damaged or, or if that area in the temporal lobe doesn't, da doesn't develop properly, the visual way of recognizing faces at a glance just doesn't work. So the person will still be able to describe like features of the face. They're seeing the face. Like the, they'll be able to say that someone has high cheekbones or wide set eyes or a small nose, but it doesn't all come together in an automated instantaneous process where it just kind of clicks who you're looking at. So they have to think through consciously, slowly, and deduce and infer who they're looking at. Like literally consciously, they have to think, yep, that person has a big nose and big blue eyes with little ears. That must be a picture of my wife. Or, well, this guy has short black hair and a beard and he's sitting in my kitchen at my breakfast table. So I'm sure it's my husband I'm looking at that's drinking coffee there. Even if they're looking in a mirror, they'll, they'll know consciously like they understand if looking in a mirror that they must be looking at their own face. They know it's a face, right? But it won't just click and automatically elicit that sense of recognition, that feeling of recognition we get automatically when we see our face in a mirror. So that's prosopagnosia or face agnosia. And there are others too. There are other agnosias like color agnosia where you can't put a name to colors. You can't even group similar hues together. Like you can't put a bunch of red color swatches with the reds and blues with the blues. That's color agnosia. But in all cases, when we get damage to the ventral stream, we're having some sort of issue with recognizing and sort of conceptualizing our visual input, putting it together into forms and making sense of those forms and shapes. We're having issues with the what function of vision. By the way, if you wanna try a little demo, pause the video and go get a piece of paper and something to write with real quick. So go ahead and get that now. Okay, what you're gonna do for this demo, if you're playing along, it's really simple. I'm gonna show you a picture with a few simple figures in it, and you can just copy the figures. Say, so on your paper with your writing implement, just copy the figures in the picture when I show it. And I want you to do the, fast, do the task as fast as you can. But while you're doing that, just try to note the order in which you drew things. So here we go, three, two, one. Just copy this as quick as you can. And now think about how you drew this. If you're like most people, you probably saw this as three objects, a circle and a couple of diamonds or tilted squares. And if you're like most people, there's a good chance you drew one of those objects, then another object, then another object. That's because your brain, when you saw this first quickly and automatically processed it as three objects, then started drawing and copying. But the brain of someone with form agnosia from, from ventral stream damage, that works differently. They don't recognize the three objects in this overall figure. They don't combine the straight and the curved lines into objects like circles or squares. So if we watch the order in which they do the line copying, while well, they're just copying the figure, we see things like the example here. First they draw line one, then line two, but instead of finishing the square, they draw a bit of the circle. Then they go around four through seven, then maybe jump over and do seven and nine, copying the, the rest of the circle at the very end there for number 10. So that's an example of like a subtle way of measuring one of these outcomes of, of form agnosia, for example. They're not seeing this as three figures. But let's also see an example of associative agnosia. So I've got a video here. It's possible you might have seen something like this before. If not though, there's a really old video, but it's a great example of associative agnosia. So the lady testing him, she'll be doing some, neuro some neuropsychological tests on this guy. He has the condition. We're gonna see whether he can visually recognize objects. Now, in the very start of the video, she's first gonna just hand him some objects. 
and he can't figure out what they are when he sees them. But when he touches or smells the object, you'll see that he definitely gets it. Like if it comes in through some other sensory channel that's still intact in his brain, that can send info to the temporal lobe and let him identify it, but not vision. So then she's going to move on to drawings of objects to see if he can identify something just from seeing a picture of it. So it's a purely visual task. He can't smell or hear the object. The first one she shows him, by the way, um, it'll be hard to see in the video, but she shows him a picture of a clarinet. So a long, straight musical instrument. And by the way, when he tries to figure out what it is, watch what his hands does and the way, what his hands do. And the way he kind of like starts to piece it together by making little musical hand gestures, because that's acting within space. That's a dorsal function, right? And then in the second half, you'll see him struggle to, to visually identify a combination lock. So she's shown him a picture of a lock like you'd use on a gym locker. And you'll see him kind of understand that it's got numbers in a circle. So he tries to infer what it might be. And he thinks it might be a phone, like one of those old rotary phones with the numbers in a circle. But he just can't quite get his brain to recognize the object for what it is, a combination lock. But once again, you'll see that he's able to get there, not through the ventral stream, because remember, his ventral stream is damaged. He has associative agnosia, but he'll make it click with the dorsal stream because he'll start to use his fingers and move as if he's acting within space, using the visual information to, to wiggle his fingers around like you would to open a lock. So pay attention to that stuff while you watch this video. Name a few things. Okay. What is that? Apple. Okay, good. Touch that. And what is that? Candle. I smell that. Good. Crayon type stuff. You know. Okay, which is it? <laughs> crayon. Because that smells better. Is this a crayon or a That's candle? That's a crayon shaped like a candle. Really? Well, if it's shaped like a candle, why wouldn't it be a candle? Because it smells like a crayon. Oh, I didn't notice you smell. <laughs> what is that? Uh, it's in his hand. He manipulates it, right? Dorsal stream. Fine. He knew how to okay, grab good. it, dorsal-wise. He knew how to grab it, but he couldn't, just looking at it, he wouldn't know what it is. So now she'll show him drawings so he can't kind of cheat through those other channels. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to show you this picture, and I'd like it's to have you just tell me what you do with that. Right with it. I'm, I don't want you to tell me. Show me oh, what you do with it. You're right. I'm sorry. It's, it's a, a, a pen, you know. Hold your hands up here where we can see, and show me what you do with it. You're right with it. It's like... Uh, a uh, ballpoint pen, you know, but it's not a ballpoint pen. Well, take your time and see if you can show me what you do with this. Well, you, uh, you write with it, but, you know, this... I don't know, because I know it doesn't, it doesn't come, on, come into focus right, you know, I... Mm -hmm. it, uh, Watch his hands. Watch his fingers. Almost like playing a flute or something. Or a clarinet. Is that a flute or something? Okay, that's close. What is that? I don't know. How'd you figure that one out? Because that's not the way I put my hands, I know. Because I've never been in a flute, and that's the first thing I thought of. Uh-huh. Did your, did your hands figure out before yeah. you before your, before you had it in, the, in yeah. your mouth? Mm -hmm. That's weird. What is that? That's a clarinet. Ah! Because his dorsal stream is still intact. So the visual information, it's getting into his eyes. It's getting into his occipital lobe. He is getting all of the visual information when he looks at it. But the use of his brain, the function that uses that visual information to recognize what it is, that is broken. That's what's not working in him. But the info is still going up the dorsal stream where you would use that information to reach out and grab something, to manipulate an, uh, an object in front of you, to use vision to know where to put your fingers on it and things like that. So that's how he's able to figure it out is by using a, a sort of back channel to get at the information through his dorsal stream 
because his ventral stream's broken. Let's continue and see the next example. It's close. That's very close. <laughs> That's good. Another thing happens, sometimes you get something stuck in your head. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so I want you to give up the telephone. It's okay. not a telephone. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm really at a loss. I, I can't. It just isn't making any sense at all now. It's a lock. He's doing is it, his fingers. Is it... Uh, bigger than a cat or smaller than a cat? Than a cat? Well, it's probably smaller than a cat. About what size is it? Well, it's about that long. Mm -hmm. about, about what that size line. is it? Telephone. Just I'm about yay by... <laughs> it's an old video. It's back when phones used to be very large. Yay. So this is smaller than a telephone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh... Does it have anything to do with communication? Yeah, because you, this is where you're, this the numbers you gotta hook up with them in order to um, dial your number or something, you know. And why do you dial the number? Because that's evidently what that that dial is for. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Let me give you. Let me give you a hint. Okay. Is I'm going to give you a choice, and you tell me what this oh, is. Okay, I can tell you then. Okay. Um, is this a clock, a lock, or a telephone? A lock. Is it a lock? A clock, a lock, or a telephone? A okay, let's let's rule out. A, let's rule out a telephone. A what? A clock or a lock? That'd be a lock. Must be a lock then. Are you are you sure? No, I'm not. But I I don't recognize it as a telephone. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize it as a lock? No, honestly, I don't. But it's just it it does it really looks very indescript to me. Uh huh. But but your hands know what they want to do. I know, and they want to do something. That's right. I can see them. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, I can just picture them, and I know okay. that I have... It's like I'm undoing a combination lock. Good. Huh. Okay, good. We had to work on that one, didn't we? <sighs> no shit. <laughs> so that's a session of Ignosia. Okay. Now this next clip's a bit longer because it's going to show two patients. So first you're going to see Peggy, who has spatial neglect. We talked about spatial neglect. It's ignoring one side of space due to ventral stream damage. Then we're going to see someone a little more complicated. So you're going to meet David in the second half, who shows something called the Capgras delusion, where he, he thinks his mom and dad have been replaced by imposters. And this sounds like some sort of psychological disorder like schizophrenia or something or someone might have some like freudian explanation for it but you'll see in the video the guy rules that out easily uh but it's not that the the person in the video david he's perfectly normal in every other way you'll see that it's an issue with his ventral stream in this case later on in the ventral stream an issue with like the way his temporal lobe is processing the info that it got the visual info info that it got from the occipital lobe so let's watch watch through these we'll see both of these case studies and then we'll talk about it Unlike Graham, Peggy Palmer has normal vision. She should be able to copy this star easily. I'll never get this star, I hope, is it? But something odd is happening. One whole side of the star is missing. Peggy has a condition called visual neglect. Although her eyesight is fine, half of her visual world no longer seems to matter. Ten years ago, Peggy suffered a stroke in the parietal lobes of her brain. The parietal lobes are concerned mainly with creating a three-dimensional representation of the spatial layout of the world, allowing a person to walk around, to navigate, to avoid bumping into things. When the right parietal is damaged, the patient is unable 
to deal with the left side of the world. This condition has fascinated neurologists for more than a century because it reveals not only how the brain shapes the way we perceive space in the present, it even determines the spatial look of our memories. This became apparent when Peggy was asked to draw a daisy from memory. Right. A daisy it shall be. For neuropsychologist Peter Halligan, Peggy's drawings reveal exactly what's gone wrong. It's like a radar system whereby the actual radar system on the left-hand side is no longer working well. If someone comes in on my left-hand side now, or I hear a sound, my eyes will immediately move to the left-hand side. That makes me, for evolutionary purposes, very aware of my environment. Because if I wasn't aware of those things, I'd have accidents. I'd get hurt, or I might get eaten by wild animals and whatever. Now, in Peggy's case, she will not attend to those things that we would normally be aware of. Peggy thinks she's drawn her daisies right, until it's pointed out to her. You've noticed that, have you? Oh, dear. So what Peggy's drawn for us is several nice daisies with the left side missing. Same with this one and this one. And look at this one. This is a very good example. I've well, done it on all of them. <laughs> Which means that she's not only neglecting events in the world, but when she conjures up a mental image, she's ignoring the left side of that mental image. Well, I thought I was going all the way around, you see. And this shows you that this is not simply a sensory problem, but mm. a problem of consciousness. I don't know. It's because I was so concentrating on that side, it takes everything away, you see. It's this attention, really. It's taken, it's taken away. This, there must be two attentions somewhere in your body that one side's taking the other one away. I can't make it out at all. Very odd. Peggy's one-sided daisies graphically reveal how damage to the visual centers can warp our consciousness of the world and how complex the human visual system actually is. When I was a medical student, I was taught there's an area in the back of the brain called visual cortex, and that's where seeing takes place. But since then, we have learned, in fact, there's not just one, there are 30 areas in the brain concerned just with seeing. For Ramachandran, a walk through this Southern California mall shows exactly what these visual areas have evolved for. And maybe these different areas are specialized for different aspects of vision. One area for seeing colors, another area for seeing movement, for form and shape, relative distance and depth. Now, despite this staggering complexity of all these different areas, there seems to be a simple overall pattern of organization. In fact, the visual input as it comes in seems to divide into two parallel streams of processing. There is one pathway, which we call the how pathway, to which some of these areas belong. And that how pathway seems to be concerned mainly with navigation, with being able to walk around, avoid bumping into obstacles, be avoiding uneven terrain, reaching out and grabbing something. The how pathway leads from the main visual areas to the parietal lobes at the top of the brain, where Peggy suffered her stroke. The other pathway, the what pathway, leads from the main visual areas to the temporal lobes, located just behind our temples. The what pathway is concerned with recognizing the object. What am I looking at? What does it mean for me? Is this an edible object? Is it a flower? Is it a person's face? What is it that I'm looking at? And what does it mean for me? That's what the what pathway is concerned with. And it's that pathway that seems to be damaged in David. David presented Ramachandran with one of the strangest cases he has ever encountered. Two years ago, David was involved in a terrible car accident while driving back to California from Mexico. There was a problem with the car, and I landed in the highway with my head first. Okay. 
but like this truck that is coming by, it's one of my friends. For five weeks, David lay in a coma. Serious injuries led to the loss of his right arm, but to everyone's relief, when he regained consciousness, his mental capacities seemed to be intact. He was articulate, he was intelligent, not obviously psychotic or emotionally disturbed. Uh, he could read a newspaper, everything seemed fine, except he had one profound delusion. He would look at his mother and he would say, this woman, doctor, she looks exactly like my mother, but in fact, she's not my mother, she's an imposter. She's some other woman pretending to be my mother. The injury to David's brain had brought on a very rare condition called the Capgras delusion. I was cooking dinner, and he probably didn't like the food that night. Okay. And, and he said, you know, the lady who comes in the morning, she cooks much better than you. Okay. It's, a, it's that lady, I like that lady very much. Okay. <laughs> but the lady was me, of course, all the time. David was also convinced that his father was an imposter. He would say to his dad, you know, I'm sure you would like to meet this guy. He's so much like you, but he drives better. He doesn't go so fast. It can look identical to him, exactly like him, but it's not him. After two months of this disturbing behavior, David's parents decided to seek help from Ramachandran. But when you looked at your, the person who looked like your father, what was your feeling? Does it, did it look like there's some other person who resembles your father? Is not really your father, something like that? Do exactly. Yeah. There's a difference that the fact that I know that that person happens not to be my father. Uh -huh. It is not my father or my mother, right? Okay. I don't expect things from that person as I would expect from my parents. No. They I got to coma. The teacher today. David not only had delusions about people, he also believed that the house that he lived in was just an imitation of his home. One day he started getting really angry. I want to go to my house. I want to go to David's house. I want to go to David's house. And we're in the apartment. And I'm just going, what am I going to do? So I decided, I said, OK, David, let's go. So I took him down the stairs. And I went around through the back, came back through the elevator, took him to bring you know, the same apartment. And I said, this is your house. And I opened the door and I said, OK, ciao. And I just left him there alone. It was the same apartment. And he looked at it and said, oh, yes, this is my apartment. Things like that would happen. Right. And, and then maybe a few days after, he would start the same. I want to go to my house, David's house. This is not David's house. Amazingly, David sometimes referred to himself as the other David as if his own self were an imposter. The Capgras delusion has been known since the turn of the century, but has been treated as a curiosity, an anomaly. The standard explanation, which you find in most psychiatry textbooks, is a Freudian one. And the idea is something like this. This young man, like most young people, when he was an infant growing up, he had strong sexual attraction to his mother, the so-called Freudian Oedipus complex. No, I, do, I, want, I, I told him, I said, he cannot evaluate me because I'm not playing. Mm. He said, wait, you're not, you evaluate your work for what? But then along comes a blow to the head, and suddenly and inexplicably, these sexual urges come flaming to the surface, and he finds himself sexually attracted to his mother, and he says, my God, if this is my mother, how come I'm attracted to her? How come I'm aroused? This must be some other strange woman. Now, this is an ingenious explanation, but it doesn't quite work. Because I've seen a patient who has the same delusion about his pet dog. He'll look at his pet dog and say, Doctor, this is not Fifi. It looks just like Fifi, but in fact, it's been replaced by another identical dog. So how does the Freudian explanation account for this, unless you start talking about the inherent bestiality in all human beings or something like that? So what really causes the Capgras delusion. Well, it turns out that when you look at an object, the message goes to the temporal lobes, to the visual centers in the temporal lobes. But seeing is a multi-level process. After you've recognized it, you also need to respond to the object emotionally. This is obvious when you look at a Picasso or a Rembrandt or any beautiful picture. Even when you look at, say, your mother's face, the appropriate emotional warmth 
has to be evoked. Or when you look at a lion, you have to be afraid. And all of this is part of the visual process, but happening in a different part of the brain. Whenever we look at an object or a face, the message reaches the temporal lobes, where it's identified. But then it gets relayed to a structure called the amygdala, which is the gateway to the limbic system that contains the emotional centers of the brain. And it's here that we generate the appropriate emotional response to whatever it is we're looking at. Now, what I've suggested is that what's going on in this patient is the message gets to the temporal lobe cortex, so the patient recognizes his mother as being his mother and evokes the appropriate memories, but the message doesn't get to the amygdala because the fibers going from the temporal lobe cortex to the amygdala and to the emotional centers are cut as a result of the accident. Therefore, there is no emotion, there is no warmth. And he says, if this is really my mother, why is it I'm not experiencing any emotions? There's something not quite right here. Maybe see some other strange woman pretending to be my mother. Ramachandran's hunch that David's delusions were being caused by the rupture of specific brain circuits was lent unexpected weight when David's mother recalled a breakthrough with the phone. David, how are you? Your papi. We got so tired of him saying, you're not my dad, you're my dad, you're not my mother, you're my mother. We decided, OK, you go downstairs, call on the phone and said, David, hi. And on the phone, he would know he was his dad. On the phone, he never, ever had this problem. Had this problem. So on the phone, he'd always recognize on the phone, the, as his father. As his father. No problem. When he saw him in person, he would in say, person, you look like my father, but, but you're, you're not, not really my father. My father. No. This shows the patient is not crazy. Why would he be crazy in person, but not on the phone? The answer is, there's a separate pathway that goes from the auditory cortex, the hearing part of the temporal lobe, to the amygdala. And that pathway was not damaged to David by the car accident. Therefore, when he listens to his father on the phone, there is no delusion. Yeah, great. This is a lovely example how you can take a completely bizarre neurological syndrome, maybe from the X-Files of neurology, which no one really understood, a person claiming that his mother is an imposter, and then come up with a very detailed explanation in terms of the known anatomy of the brain, saying, here is where the flaw is and then doing an experiment that takes just an hour to do. So this first one's... And showing that this is what's gone wrong in this patient. Okay, are you comfortable? To test his theory about the Capra delusion, Ramachandran arranges to measure David's galvanic skin response, which is the basis of the lie detector test. If David's brain were normal, he would react emotionally to this picture of his father. This, in turn, would stimulate an almost indiscernible increase of sweat on his skin and a heightening of electrical resistance that can be measured. The prediction is that when people with normal brains look at photographs of people they don't know, they will not respond emotionally. So there will be no change in skin resistance. But a familiar face will prompt an emotional response, and invariably, there is a change. Now the question is, what happens with David? If Ramachandran's theory is correct, pictures of his parents will not evoke an emotional response, so the line should remain flat. Now, this is also telling you about how all of us, how normal people, respond to faces and to objects. Because what happens in this patient is truly extraordinary. The lack of emotional response actually leads him to this very profound delusion that this person is not really his mother. In other words, the lack of the autonomic gut reaction, this emotional response, leads him to an absurd conclusion, overriding what his intellect is telling him. And this tells you how closely linked your intellectual view of the world is to your basic emotional reactions to the world. Luckily for Capgras patients, the condition seems to heal itself. David no longer thinks his mother is an imposter. 
and the man who looks like his father is his father and triggers the flow of all the old familiar feelings. David's lack of emotional response showed just how crucial emotions are to the recognition process of the normal brain. So what's happening with David was not prosopagnosia, right? It wasn't an issue with recognition sort of, but it wasn't that basic level of face recognition because he could look at their face and recognize instantly and automatically that, yeah, it's his mom's face or his dad's face. So visual face recognition was fine for David, but what we think might be damaged here is the connection between where the brain recognizes the face and the emotion centers or other areas that create a sense of familiarity for a face you recognize, connections with that. So in his case, the, the processing stops before it gets there. So it looks like his mom or dad, but doesn't feel familiar like his mom or dad should. So what's happening is the brain just confabulating and assuming an imposter. So yeah, okay, that's the definition there. Okay, by the way, even though we've concentrated on the visual modality for our, our tour of perception here, the same dual stream layout seems to apply for other senses too. So for example, when we hear something, the neural signals go from our ears into the brain, and the first stop in the cortex is called A1, the primary auditory cortex. It's a little clump of neurons near the top of the temporal lobe. But from there, the info gets shared with other parts of the brain. And indeed, there are a couple major pathways of axonal projections, so axons going out, that go up and back toward the parietal lobe, and others that go down and forward lower into the temporal lobe. So sure enough, the dorsal stream for auditory information processes where sounds come from, like behind me or in front of me or to the left, or the fact that a sound is getting closer to me, the spatial aspects of sound. And the ventral stream coming out of A1 goes like further down in the temporal. It's a sort of what pathway for sounds. So it processes what we're hearing, that it was a cat's meow or Michael Scott's voice, a high-pitched tone, a door slamming, or recognizing the words that a person is speaking. In other words, this is a fundamental and basic organization of the brain for, for organizing and making sense of the input we get to any of our senses, be it sight, sound, touch, or whatever. All that info gets shared and integrated together, and that happens in an orderly way based on the functions that use that information. And indeed, there are some other differences in the two systems, like the ventral system in the, in the left column here. Uh, it is for sort of recognizing and identifying things as the what stream, right? But also as far as sensitivity goes, it's really sensitive to visual details, whereas the dorsal system isn't paying as much attention to details, to the little details of the picture, more about uh, big picture stuff or temporal resolution, like timing details, meaning motion and movement and change. Likewise, the visual system is where we're kind of recognizing and categorizing what we see. So it's part of a memory system with long-term stored representations of what things are, our concepts of what things look like. What's a basketball? What's a car? What's a house? What's a face? Whereas the dorsal system really just briefly holds the visual information long enough to place it within space or to interact with it, like reaching out and approaching a thing. As far as speed goes, the dorsal system is actually super fast relative to the other. It processes things quicker than the ventral system. So think of it like, if you see a ball approaching your head and you dodge it quickly using that visual information, right? That happens very fast. But to actually recognize it as a basketball and process that it's orange, that happens much slower. And that's, that's a ventral stream thing, often after you've already reacted to the ball, which relates a little to our conscious experience. Like, we generally are more consciously aware of the processing that our ventral stream does. It's only after the ventral stream has done its thing that we often realize or, or uh, you know, have an experience of what we're seeing. Whereas some of that dorsal processing happens outside of conscious awareness, where it starts happening long before we're consciously aware of what we're seeing. We've evolved a brain that'll start reacting to a pouncing tiger before we actually have any phenomenological experience that we're seeing a tiger and recognizing what it is our brain starts some things on autopilot. And later it adds the conscious perception of, oh, I'm seeing this and I can think about that. And there are some other differences identified in the literature, but we don't need to go through those. I just want to give a basic feel for, for the two systems. And by the way, 
I want to make it clear that those those two systems we've talked about, while they are clearly distinct and, and subserving different functions, they do interact and they send a lot of kind of feedback to each other. And in fact, there are plenty of axonal projections connecting the brain areas that are involved in those two different pathways. So as usual, the reality is a bit more nuanced and messy than just this basic organization we've learned about, but we'll leave that for like a higher level neuroscience course. Anyway, that'll end our dive into perception. In the, the videos we've seen, we've, we've learned how the brain sees by, by recognizing very simple little features like lines and edges, and then from that, recognizing more complex combinations of those features like angles and squares and circles, and then three-dimensional forms made out of those. We've also learned how what we see is kind of a construction invented by the brain, right? Based on its best educated guess of the world out there, a sort of simulated 3D reality or a controlled hallucination that our brain is doing 24 seven to help us make sense of the ambiguous input that hits our sensory receptors and sends pew, 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 pew neural signals into our brain. We saw examples of the rules the brain follows in, in making these educated guesses, like size and shape and color constancy. We saw those gestalt principles, and we saw how, how many complicated steps there are in perception. So to the point that the different brain areas getting damaged leads to very specific issues with different parts of perceptual function. Now in the next big topic after this one, we're gonna move on to something a bit higher level, which is attention. So I'll see you there.